All right, so let's, uh, I think next thing will be we start uh, this panel discussion. I will go through the list of questions we already, we are already collecting on the shared Google documents. So the first one is from my friend Corey, and he's asking from the perspective of educators, how should students prepare for the error of large generative language models? Is it necessary to remove take home or open internet exams at all? I, I've made a push back to paper exams. Uh, it definitely like, I, I love the, you know, using uh, Canvas and, you know, these uh, learning system quizzes cause they auto grade, they're just easy. But, you know, if the, there's something about the, if, if students are gonna be using, you know, chat GPT or whatever while taking the quiz, it's it seems to defeat the point. So in, in many instances I've reverted back to paper exams and, um, or using tools that'll lock down the browser, you can kind of get a you know a hybrid effect where there are softwares these lockdown browsers that will prevent you from being able to open any other window while you're taking the exam. So we've definitely since the onset of uh, ChatGPT, we've started to <laughs> explore those tools a lot more seriously. Well, um, I think I think this is a very timely discussion point. Uh, there's a lot of discussion among educators, mainly about ChatGPT. Uh, my opinion is that we need to embrace these new technologies. And as teachers, it's our job to be creative uh, when we are creating the questions, as well as we need to be transparent with the students. Um, in our program, uh, we have written guidelines uh, for students when they can use ChatGPT and when it is considered as cheating, for example, if you have a probability question for your test and if you put the whole question and get the answer, um, then that is considered as, as cheating. But if you um, wrote a report and ask it to like correct this grammatically, then I think um, that is not considered as cheating because you know we have a lot of international students and English is not their first language. Um, so I think using like getting help from these tools is in, in that area would be okay. And there are a lot of ways we can use this in our education where we could use it as a self-guided like learning tool. Like we can ask students, for example, um, if you're teaching about probability distributions, we can ask students to um, come up with questions on uh, for different probability distributions and then try to use ChatGPT to get the answers and then compare it with your answers because ChatGPT is not always reliable. So it kind of can, we can also like think of ways that students can use these for, um, you know, uh, for self-guided learning. And then um, I think the same conversation happened when they introduced calculators years ago. Uh, I know some professors who taught at that time and they mentioned that they had the same conversation, whether they were, uh, they had this conversation about whether allowing students to use calculators for exams. So um, it's, I think, again, like we could, we could be creative about questions like we are, students actually have to like think critically about the question and there's not a lot of wriggle room to cheat. And, but if, if it is actually like a coding um, question and it is really, if you, if you think that ChatGPT can be used, then we can definitely can make it a, like an in-person exam. Um, so. I think yeah. this point that you make uh, for now about um, faculty being clear with students is really important. Cause I think the students are as confused as the faculty and uh, you know, if there are no clear guidelines, then it's really kind of a Pandora's box. And I think it's that helping people navigate the situation and provide clarity. That's one of the things that I've heard. Um, it was actually from a musicology faculty member at Hopkins in terms of innovative uses of natural language models was that she finds with writing um, or critiquing reasoning arguments that the students are very hesitant to critique each other because they feel bad criticizing each other in front of the faculty member in particular. Um, so they will have ChatGPT generate 
some text or some reasoning argument, and then all the students critique chat GPT. And she found that to be much more uh, productive because the students aren't held up by the etiquette of the situation. So yeah, I think there are a lot of innovative ways to use these tools in the classroom and we, we've only started exploring them. Yeah. Perna mentioned the good point that when, when students start to use chat GPT, uh, you know, for assignments or for research, not necessarily for answering exam questions. Uh, it, it can be interesting when they realize that chat GPT is giving them wrong answers, <laughs> right? And that's that's a helpful exercise, right? So I've had I've had students uh, intentionally use chat GPT to help with uh, project planning and coming up with deliverables and, and milestones for hypothetical research projects. And chat GPT is great at that. Right. I would like to design an ice phobic coating using this material. Can you help me? And, and you'll get a draft of a project plan and a timeline. Works great. If you then ask Chat GPT to give me, you know, give me a one paragraph summary of this technology with references, it's incredible because Chat GPT will give you references. <laughs> they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so you'll get a reference and as a subject matter expert, I'll look at that and I'll say, "Ooh, I got to get that reference. Why haven't I seen that?" And you'll you'll go try to find it, and you realize it's made up. It's just using names that sound right, and the title of the paper sounds okay. And so that's a good lesson for students to, you know, kind of feel in their gut, like, "Oh, it makes sense," but there's no foundation there once you start to unpack it. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I want to point out one of the benefits that I've, I've observed a lot of lately. I think coding has become more accessible than ever, right? Yeah. It as, as your sort of constant companion, uh, coding is about making a, a program that, that works, right? Something that you can, you can use to, to leverage compute to, to get to an answer, to get to greater insight. And I think a lot of the things that we're, we're mentioning here are things that, you know, we're all going to have to figure out how to reinvent how we do things. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, maybe teaching. Um, but I think that uh, looking looking at it as an opportunity is really important. And then finally, um, some of these limitations that we're talking about, you know, within a matter of years, most likely those challenges will be overcome. The, the pace of advancement is exponential. So the, the tools to exclude them from education, I think are going to become vanishingly small. Um, potentially that paper form will work, but then you have to ask yourself, what am I teaching the student by asking them a question that I have to exclude a tool that they'll have when they're out in the workforce? Thank you so much. I think uh, we're uh, going really deep in this uh, direction right now. We have a lot of other uh, questions being collected on the shared Google document. So let's start another topic. Um, David is asking, are there particular data sets that you think might be engaging to pre-college students and help them make connections to STEM rather uh, to STEM rather than yet another tutorial on NYC taxi data? <laughs> So I think the spirit of this question is that, do you have recommendations for pre-college students or even college students I, uh, as a starting yeah. point to practice their machine learning um, skills so, using real life data? Yeah, so we've worked with a number of pre-college students, I mean, ranging from age approximately nine up, and they're much more sophisticated than we usually imagine them to be. I mean, I think they understand that their communities have issues and needs, and they're interested in being part of addressing those issues and needs. So I think particularly in, you know, like in the city of Baltimore, um, addressing things like public health issues, if there's data about um, water quality or about um, heat islands, or things that really in, involve the um, immediate environment they live in, I think they see the connections. Um, that kind of data, I think, could be really compelling to students. Um, and also, there are so many data sources out there. For example, 
if you want to do um, if you want to analyze weather data, you could uh, look at NOAA, and then you can uh, download data. And then if you want to um, look at I don't know macroeconomic variables, you can you can go to Bureau of Economic Analysis and Freds. Um, there are so many data so like sources out there, but the thing is that um, I I don't know if the undergraduate education provide enough guidance to uh, students to work on different data because data is unique and uh, they need to understand like how to deal with different type of data and different issues you know there could be like bias um, issues like bias variance flexibility and then you may have like small data sets there may be high variation and then there may be large data sets um, how do you work with high dimensional data or like there may be um, non-linearity, um, like how, when do you use regularization methods? It's like there are a lot of things to be considered when you take a data set. For, and also like this is something that I have seen in many places. People use machine learning models on time series data. It is statistically incorrect. If there is high serial correlation among these stochastic data, you cannot directly apply machine learning models. So all these variables like GDP, inflation, and temperature data, all of these, they have a temporal like time component. So I think, um, first of all, students need to have a background, a good background or good foundation in math, stat, uh, theoretical background of these, how these machine learning models work. And then I think they will be able to successfully analyze the data. I don't it's my opinion. I have with the statistical statistics PhD. I think um, I highly, highly think that you need to have a necessary uh, background theoretical knowledge of how these AI machine learning tools work, so that you can apply it on a data data set. Because there are a lot of um, like there are a lot of programming packages out there. It's really easy to use a machine learning model on a data set, but it doesn't mean that it's correct. There are a lot of uh, things to consider when you're fitting models. So uh, data is unique. Um, so I think um, I think college level, like um, graduate level education is 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 the best um, that you can get a, like a really good understanding of how everything works. I really like oh, Please go ahead. Go ahead. I like what Michael said about the, the connecting to like tangible things, especially for young people. You know, I, I remember like kind of an aha moment for me as an undergraduate was um, doing like numerical solutions to the double pendulum and then doing it in a laboratory and seeing those curves sync up and just being like blown away that like the theoretical model and the experimental measurements. I mean, I know that's kind of that's not something for a high school student necessarily, but just that connection with something tangible and seeing that like, oh, there, you know, math is a model of the real world and that connection to it. So that more flows into sort of mathematical modeling and, you know, differential equations and whatnot. But um, just that tangible nature of that really, as you mentioned with the Baltimore data and, and that sort of thing, just really um, tying it back to something very familiar, important and intangible, I think is a great point. Especially for younger, you know, as you get older, you can handle more abstraction. But when you're younger, that it's hard to make that connection to highly abstract concepts. It's easier to see something, you know, very tangible and direct. I think the other thing that we see students connect with immediately is if they can see that this is something you do as a job and it pays you money. <laughs> like, because, um, I mean... It, I think we sometimes forget, like the, even the schools, like just a walking distance from our campus, many of those students, they've never met an engineer. They've never met somebody who does STEM for their living, right? And so just having something where you say, okay, we're gonna do this and let me show you how we do this. And look, this is this is like my job, you know, and they and I and I'm doing pretty well with it, you know. Um they, they they see that that's can kind of, can be transformative because they suddenly see a pathway that they didn't know existed. Michael, that's a great transition into the next question. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so let's talk about, no, this is a good question. Let's talk about how should we prepare students for the job market, given many jobs may soon disappear? I, so I, I like this question. I'll, I'll chime in. I've got a hot take on this, and I'm kind of torn being a, a chemistry and biochemistry professor, uh, because I actually think a lot of uh a lot of wet bench chemistry and biochemistry jobs are not going to exist in our generation, you know, in our lifetime. I tell my students, uh, you know, the the job that you think a chemist does, just pipetting, squirting all day, or doing a titration in the lab, is is quickly being automated and roboticized. We still need people who are skilled in the art of chemistry and who can talk chemistry but they also now need to understand large sets of, of chemical data, how to design materials, and how to essentially orchestrate the robots and the machines that are going to be um, really taking over a lot of these labs, right? And so uh, I, I love teaching titration, but I think in 30 years, doing a titration by hand is going to seem like, um, you know, like a like a Renaissance fair demonstration, right? I think it's going to be very archaic. I'm doing this artisanal hand handmade titration. And uh, so I, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of torn. Luckily I'm, I'm you know, middle-aged uh, set in my career. So I don't need to worry about it, but uh, it's going, it's certainly going to affect a lot of jobs. And um, if they're replying, if they're relying on purely mechanical skills, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be in for some hurt. Yeah, for the um, data science program, a lot of students go into technical like tech companies, and then now tech companies don't hire a lot of students. Um, so we we try to be more interdisciplinary, and we we are trying to go in other directions, like having a degrees in masters and PhD with data science plus uh, biostatistics or social sciences. We try to go in other directions as well, hoping that students can uh, get, because data, data is being used everywhere. Data science is be, being used every, uh, every disciplinary, uh, but for the tech companies, they're not hiring, they're, they, they have kind of like a hiring freeze. So, so we try to um, like have a, better curriculum for students so that they would uh, be able to find jobs in other areas, uh, financial or any other different areas. I think uh, one of the skills, I think as a, when you, uh, in any job industry, I think digital data storytelling is a very, very important skill in industry. Uh, if you're looking for job in industry, um, we have, um, as a data science program, we have many speakers, we have a big network around DC, we have our own career fair, so we invite employers. So they tell us that we have this digital data storytelling class in our program, and they tell us that it's really, really important. And even the students said that getting a job, it helped them like really well. So, you know, you, I mean, you need to know how to tell a like a story of what you have done, like what is your data science question, why it is important, why you're analyzing this, and you need to tell a story about how, like you have to captivate the audience audience attention and explain it in a way even a non-technical person can understand why it is important, what are the social impacts of what you have done. So we emphasize story, data storytelling in every single class. And I think, um, I don't know if, if you're looking for like in job interviews, I think there are uh, technical parts um, where they ask for like skills in programming and knowledge in SQL, and also um, questions in probabilistic modeling, statistical computing. Um, and so I think it's a plus if you have um, knowledge in, um, you know, big data tools like um, AWS, Azure, and you know, um, in our program, we have um, uh, faculty members who are working in companies like Microsoft, AstraZeneca, AWS. So they like when there is a new tool, they always talk about that, and we try to incorporate everything into our um, into into our curriculum. So um, just keep up. I mean, when you're looking at the skills, just I'm just saying like just keep up with the uh, new technologies and like 
like a lot of people use like GitHub Colab, Copilot, Cordo, like command line interface. These things are like very important when you're looking for a job. All right. Yes. Well, one thing actually to add, just to add to, someone mentioned at the beginning, I think it's just completely essential, just the the commitment to continual learning and the continual growth, like it learning to learn is the most important skill that you can possess, right? Like, Cause like, if you know how to teach yourself new skills, then there's no problem with the changing technology landscape. You just adapt and learn how to adapt. And so like trying to, which is a difficult thing to teach, right? And so sometimes I, I kind of informally try to push students to do this is almost switch from a content consumer to a content creator. And like, at this point you can like, there's, there's tools that you can, you know, easily almost write your own book. Like, I don't know if people might be familiar with it or may not be, but we, we've started using Corto very heavily recently, which is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, it's a really awesome tool set for sort of the next generation of our markdown. It's, it's sort of Jupyter notebook based, but for content creation, you have a single source, file, but you can convert it to a website, a book. It, it's just one source, but multiple output. And so we're getting students to use that. It, it's basically, again, it's like next generation of R Markdown, but that coupled with um, tool. So using this Corto tool for publishing and, and kind of trying to get the students to, even if no one ever reads it, just creating your own content and almost like writing your own book, right? If you need to learn something, one of the easiest ways to, to learn it is just pretend like you have to teach it to someone and then just try and get as familiar as you can with it. And uh, so it's sort of a sales pitch for Corto, but uh, which I feel okay about because I fell in love with it last year. I've been using it just constantly. I absolutely love it. And um, also another tool, this is more just a sales pitch for a tool that I started using is there's this cool tool called um, MathPix, which is optical character recognition that'll kind of automatically screenshot things and pull it in as LaTeX and Markdown. So it like, comes in really nice. It just makes your work, it's just a point of friction to remove your workflow. And I encourage students to use that too. Again, if you're making content, they can, instead of, you know, writing LaTeX is tedious. And if you can get something to do that for you, you know, an optical character recognition, to just screenshot an equation and it comes straight in as LaTeX, it's super useful. So something I've also fallen in love with, totally unrelated to the question, but sales pitch for a tool that I like, but anyway. Continual learning. That was the point of my uh, rant. Apologies. <laughs> all right. So uh, I have a specific question for Eric. I'm trying to cover all the questions from different um, uh, members in the audience. So this is a specific question for Eric. In terms of programming languages, do you think we will go from Maple to MATLAB to Python to natural language in the next three to five years? How would that affect the data or programming literacy of students in material science? Uh, well, there is, that's a great question. I mean, there's multiple parts to that question, right? Um, that's, that's murky territory to go in, right? If we can eventually replace our, you know, the need for human programming and coding, if we can replace that with large language models, well, then it, I guess it depends on how good those models are, right? But I could see it. A, a stifling effect in, in, in terms of the creative software that's being generated now. So I, that, you know, the, the programming literacy, I don't know if there's, you know, you still want to teach some of these people how to code, right? And how to program, right? So, you know, take your Python courses, read your Python books, but then use chat GPT or other models to, to augment or supplement your coding exercises. In a, in a course curriculum, that's, that's a really good question. Right. I could kind of see, you know, a lot of students, we don't we don't use um, uh, Wolfram Alpha in any of our coursework, but a lot of students do because they understand that Wolfram Alpha will answer a question for them and will actually show them the steps and show them how to take the derivative and do the math. And I think that's very helpful. So once these models evolve to being able to do that for general purpose questions, then it, it is foreseeable that maybe now we don't need Python in our PCHEM classes. Maybe now we need a, a you know next generation large language model that can actually show you how the steps are done and show you how the math works and it's correct 
and you can export Python code or R code and run it on your own, and it would be a little more interactive. Uh, but that's risky, right? Because then you're, you know, then it's prompt engineering, <laughs> right? And there's a lot to be said for creative prompt engineering, right? But prompt engineering is not the same as creatively coming up with a solution to your programming problem, right? And prompt engineering is also definitely not the same thing as solving physical chemistry equations, even though you could use one, you know, you could use one for, for the other. That's a good question. I don't know. I'll let you know when it happens in three years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question for Michael. Uh, Michael, you are uh, serving as the Vice Dean for Undergrad Education Writing School of Engineering. So, I mean, that's basically human language writing versus like computer language writing, right? And I, and I know those large language models are trained to process human language specifically. So uh, what's the uh, specific um, thing that we need to update in the future if we're trying to teach our kids how to write? Right, okay. Um... So, uh, but you're asking, so maybe I'm not following the question exactly. So you're talking in the context of AI ML, how that's going to affect writing pedagogy? Exactly, Is in the new it? era of AI and you have those large language models available to the students. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're, we're, we're gonna have to, our students will have to learn to coexist with the, with the assistance provided by those models. But how can we like, make sure that the students are successful and then they can learn uh, writing properly together uh, with the existence of those large generated well, languages. I mean, I actually, I think the, the large language models can be very helpful actually for students to learn to write because I mean, I think oftentimes, you know, there's generating ideas and there's writing clearly and correctly, right? And I think, starting with some prior thing and then having to transform it into something that's more clear or better written or more um, is actually a very useful exercise. Um, and I think also one of the limitations in writing instruction is providing good feedback. So I think there's a real um, potential I mean, I don't think it's quite realized yet, but for these large language models, especially for early learners and beginning learners to be able to send text into the machine and get um, immediate feedback. Whereas for a grader, you know, faced with a hundred students who've each produced a three page paper, that's hours and hours of labor. Um, so, you know, I think there's real high potential. You know, I would say just with the vice, as long as I have the vice dean hat on, one of the things I think is a real challenge in the AI ML space, not talking about writing now, is the fact that I see this proliferation of, of machine learning and data science coursework, but there's like no coherent pathway through this coursework. So I have this nightmare, recurring nightmare, where I wake up and like everybody's only learning like, linear regression over and over and over again you know like in <laughs> physics we have pathways you know where we know okay you've learned classical mechanics we're not going to give you credit for learning classical mechanics again but i'm not sure ai and data science our our curriculum has evolved to the point where we're not just reteaching the same stuff to our students over and over and giving them additional credits you know thanks michael i think this oh go ahead Oh, uh, well, I just had a thought on that front, right? So I, I kind of wonder if it's quickly going to become overcome by events, right? Um, the, the accessibility, the reason why natural language processing in general, um, or well, yeah, large language models, let's go with that, um, have, have picked up so quickly in the last year. It's because they're accessible to the masses, right? It doesn't require you to understand what linear regression is in order to, to get something useful out the other end. And so I wonder if the accessibility of, of these sort of advanced tools will mean that they just become part of our tool set and we'll just sort of have a new baseline to work with. Well, one thing that I've, that kind of uh, uh, piggybacks onto what Michael was saying in terms of writing is 
that I try to push students to do is, and it's something I've adopted as well, is using uh, text to voice, like almost continuously. Like I use it all the time for anything that's going to be read by, you know, more than a few people. I'll at least once use some sort of, you know, voice or text to voice tool to listen to it once. And it seems like a minor thing, but I catch so many, like, it just flows. Like, I catch little typos and things that sound weird. And, like, those tools, I mean, it's a different form of AI, obviously. I mean, it still is a machine learning algorithm. But it they've gotten good enough that they can read text in sort of a natural way. And you can say, oh, there's got to be a comma there. Or, like, if you have a run-on sentence and you run it through one of those tools, it's just going to run straight through it and it sounds wrong. Like it, And so you can catch all kinds of little grammatical mistakes and and like I've done it to some of my, I, I try to, you know, f recommend that students do it as well for, you know, kind of publication quality work, um, final versions of things. And I've also run, you know, when I started using it at, at first, it was almost embarrassing when I listened to some of the stuff that I write. It's just because your brain, when you read it, your brain can't catch those weird little things. And there's one or two words that are off. And if you, re when you read it visually, you don't catch it. And then you listen to it and you're like, oh my gosh, how did I not, how was that? how did I let that typo slip through there? And then just looking back at some of my older writings and older emails, it's like just embarrassing. <laughs> so it, that is a, I found helpful for community. It's just like a really basic communication tool to improve writing quality. It's just listening to it once before you send it to whoever. Um, and like on Mac, for instance, you can just push alt escape and it'll read anything on the screen to you and in a pretty good, you know, it's, it's not Microsoft Sam, but it's, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's decent voice to text or text to voice software. So I find that very useful. And I hope students do too. I try to push students to use it. Yeah. I, I think the thing about um, natural language processing that I think where it's, where we're using it for what it was designed to do, which is develop naturalistic text, you know, or interpret text, you know, it makes sense to me, but you know, the fact that it's just sort of producing a string of words that conform to a prior database in some statistical way, you know, the thing that I think is scary is that people just naturally see a string of words and start attaching meaning and thought and desires and purpose to it. And it's like, no, this is like, you know, word salad. It's very intelligent word salad, but it is essentially just word salad and people need to understand that you know it's kind of interesting you could almost imagine like a feedback loop where society changes its definitions in accordance with chat gpt because like if the if society <laughs> starts to view that as like the arbiter of truth and so you define you know what is uh what is test data i think was what we were discussing and if you ask chat gpt what is test data versus training data or whatever and if it's it's going to spit something out and if everyone is doing that, instead of looking at some alternative source, that could become the uh, like the accepted definition of that term over like, so it's almost like a, a creep of this kind of artificial definition, arbiter of truth, redefining what we, you know, over years, we could kind of have it redefine what, what thing, what, I mean, that would only work for kind of definitional sort of things, you know, not sort of, it's not going to obviously change what, F equals MA is or something like that. But for like s sort of subjective human based definitions, it could definitely sort of drift them into a different space or something like that. So, yeah. So People sort of, desire sources of authority, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the scary part. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, I think we're about to end our session, but I do have this, I do see this wonderful uh, question. I have to uh, ask it. What about the question is what about the use of large language model capability to help us teaching coding? So I'll I'll take a quick crack at that one. I think that it gives uh that instant response uh that another panelist was talking about, right? The big problem with coding is figuring out where you went wrong, right? So it becomes your rubber duck, right? You say, "Hey, I have this code, why is it not working?" And then it can be because you don't understand one of the aspects of it. And you can say, hey, how do arrays work? Or how do loops work? Or, or whatever it is. And it becomes a great tutor that gives customized instant responses that doesn't contain the biases of me as the lecturer. I, I wanted to bring that up in a, you basically hit on something I wanted to bring up in a previous question is, 
instead of asking students to code, you could just give them broken code and ask them to fix it. Like, so the assignment could become just, because debugging is one of the harder parts of coding, right? And so just break a whole bunch of code and say, all right, your job is, this code is badly broken in various places. You need to figure out why it's broken and you need to fix it. So it could be a good, uh, it's basically exactly what, you're, what uh, Chris was just mentioning, but that could be a new direction to sort of deal with it instead of creation, focus on correction debugging yeah and at the same time as i was saying before not everything is like very reliable of what like some chat provides codes that are not actually working also like i think gpd three threes or four maybe not advanced enough but maybe in the future it would be more advanced to uh provide us I mean, for as educators, we would be able to actually use this as a tool in the class. But I don't know. Right now, it's it's okay. But I have seen it many times, pr like producing bad codes. So, yeah. Students will have to learn how to live with it, right? <laughs> yes. All right. I think this is a good time to conclude our uh, discussion panel. Thank you uh, very much for this wonderful panel discussion. So this shared Google document will be will kept on uh, will be shared for a couple of more days. And if you can, if you guys see any questions that you can, you, you feel that you can fee, uh, provide better feedback, you can directly type on it. And then. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go to the summary of this wonderful afternoon. And then right after that, we're going to go, uh, we're going to announce our outstanding post awards and presentations. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you, everyone. It's a lot of fun. Thanks. Nice to meet you all.